Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to News Dose. And to start off this week, PlayStation continues to make some noise online. Yeah, it seems like they do have quite a bit going on over there, as it sounds like they might have had to actually switch developers on one of their upcoming current projects. And then also, one of their fan favorite first party studios still might have a secret project in development. So, we're going to go over both of those today. And then also, Xbox, yes, they were in the news once again, as it looks like one of their upcoming Xbox console exclusives might have leaked out online. So, we'll go over that one as well. To start this video off though, we're actually going to be talking about a major acquisition made by Take-Two. Of course, we've seen the consolidation within the game industry a lot over the last couple years, but I have to say this acquisition in specific was definitely surprising to say the least because Take-Two has now acquired Zynga Games. Now, at first glance, Zynga is an acquisition that's not necessarily going to affect hardcore gamers that much that plays on consoles and PC as Zynga is more known for making mobile style games such as Farmville and Words with Friends. But at the same time, this was a massive acquisition and actually Take-Two spent $12.7 billion to acquire Zynga. Now to kind of put into perspective how much that actually was, this is actually a record breaking acquisition and I mean, well, if you take a look at the Bethesda acquisition made by Xbox, which we all know how massive that acquisition was, that was $7.5 billion. So here you have Zynga acquired for $12.7 billion. That is absolutely crazy. But that's kind of the thing because social games can make a lot of money over on mobile phones. And Zynga really is one of the poster childs of exactly that. So even though this acquisition is not necessarily super exciting when it comes to core gaming, it's still a massive acquisition nonetheless. But with all that in mind, one thing that you can do with an acquisition like this is maybe that they could turn some of their big franchises such as Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, maybe they could get Zynga to work on some high profile games like this for the mobile market. We'll kind of see about all that, but there you have it. Take-Two just made the biggest acquisition in gaming history at $12.7 billion. Next up, we have a really interesting topic here about Dying Light 2. Okay, so Dying Light 2 has received several different delays since it was first announced back in 2018. But now that it's finally almost here, as it is set to release on February 4th of next month, now we're just kind of hoping those delays will have been worth it. And at least in terms of content, the developers definitely seem to have put a lot of content into Dying Light 2 because check this out. Over on Twitter, they posted this very confidently as they said, to fully complete Dying Light 2 Stay Human, you'll need at least 500 hours, almost as long as it would take to walk from Warsaw to Madrid. And while on paper all of this sounds really impressive and everything, it seems like this tweet has backfired on them quite a bit. The community didn't respond to this maybe the way that they were expecting because now there seems to be a large part of the community that thinks that this is just far too long. And I'm not necessarily going to disagree here. I know everybody's kind of going to have different preferences in terms of how long they want their game to be. I know for myself, I don't necessarily like whenever games are overly long. There's actually two different parts of this. One would be quality over quantity. From my own personal experience, a lot of times whenever these games are overly long, they tend to be a little bit poorly paced and bloated even. Now there are some exceptions to that and I do want to point that out. Something like Red Dead Redemption 2 as an example, I believe that's like a 50 plus hour long game and I thought it had an extraordinary story so it really all depends on the game. The other part of this though is that a game that's really long is also a big time commitment for fans and not everybody's going to want to commit that much time to a singular game so yeah when i hear that a game is 500 hours long yeah I, that's a little much for myself and maybe some people out there really loves that idea but you know personally for myself i'm not nonetheless though techland did seem to understand that a large part of the community was not necessarily happy hearing about this so they actually clarified the issue by saying that they were talking about 100 percent completion if you just want to focus on the story and side missions, they said that was going to take roughly 70 to 80 hours, which is still really, really long, but it still sounds much better than 500 hours. 
Okay, so after I finished recording, they actually posted one more update about Dying Light 2 and how long it actually takes to complete this game. And now they're saying that it actually takes 20 hours to complete the main story, while it takes 80 hours to complete the story and all of its side missions. So it just seemed like the day we're trying to overinflate those numbers a little bit, but there you have it. It will take 20 hours to complete its main story. Next up, we do have an Xbox leak to talk about today, as it looks like a big game might be heading over to Xbox consoles sometime here soon, being Age of Empires 4. Now, I don't necessarily think that this is overly surprising, considering Age of Empires is an Xbox first-party title, but this game did launch exclusively on PC, which actually does make sense. This is a PC franchise, a very popular PC franchise, which we'll come back to here in just a moment. But this is something that we have seen Xbox do a few different times in the past. You take a look at something like Gears Tactics and then Flight Simulator, both of those games launched exclusively on PC as well. And then sometime later, both of those games did eventually make their way over to Xbox. So I kind of figured something similar was going to happen here with Age of Empires 4 as well. So what's happening here, this was spotted by a Twitter user by the name of Illumia Italia, who is known for digging around the Xbox store and leaking information. And apparently this Twitter user did find references to Age of Empires 4. Illumia did post this over on Twitter showing the XIP car January 2022, aka Cardinal January 2022, now available for internal testing in the Xbox Insider Hub. And what's interesting about this is that Cardinal is the code name for Age of Empires 4 and XIP very well might actually mean Xbox Insider Preview. So if that is all the case, then it looks like testing is being done right now for Age of Empires 4 over on Xbox consoles. Now we do need to see how all of this plays out, but I do think that this is very plausible. And the reason I say that is because back in November, World's Edge creative director Adam Iskarine did say that the team would start thinking about how to make the game run on consoles. So we did already kind of know that this was going to happen, but it looks like it's progressing pretty fast as they're already possibly doing internal testing. And even though I don't think that this is necessarily majorly unexpected or anything, this is still really exciting news though, because like I said before, Age of Empires is a really big franchise. I, I feel like console gamers don't always realize this, but Age of Empires is a massive franchise over on PC, and Age of Empires 4 has performed very, very well over on PC. Despite this game being available on PC Game Pass, it has topped charts several times over on Steam. In fact, Age of Empires 4 was one of the top 25 best-selling games over on Steam for the entirety of 2021. And then to just kind of top everything off, this was a very well-received game. It does have an 81 overall score on Metacritic, so it looks like Xbox fans will get yet another high-quality release sometime here soon with Age of Empires 4. Let's go and talk about PlayStation though, as it looks like a few different things are happening here. One of which is something that we kind of already talked about in the past, so I'm not going to talk about this one too long, but Guerrilla Games last week did announce that they are working on Horizon Call of the Mountain. This is a PlayStation VR 2 game that is being collaborated between Fire Sprite and then apparently Guerrilla Games. And since then, I have seen some speculation that maybe Horizon Call of the Mountain is that secret project that we keep hearing about in terms of Guerrilla Games. Games. But it's now actually being pointed out that some different job listings over at Guerrilla Games actually describes that they are working on unannounced video game projects as in plural. You can actually take a look at this job listing here and it says, mostly at my time in Guerrilla Games Studio, I worked on Horizon Forbidden West video game, PS4, PS5 first party exclusive, and unannounced video game projects. So here you can actually see that apparently that they are working on multiple unannounced projects, one of which more than likely was Horizon Call of the Mountain. I do suspect that Fire Sprite is more than likely the lead developer on Horizon Call of the Mountain with Guerrilla Games more or less kind of overseeing the project and giving them some help. That kind of leans back to what we've been hearing about Guerrilla Games for a while now though is that they might actually have a secret game in development, a pretty good sized game as well. Apparently Simon LaRouche has been working with Guerrilla Games as a game director since early 2018 on supposedly some kind of unannounced title, and if it's not Call of the Mountain, 
Mountain, then it very well could be yet another game. Now, Simon LaRouche has actually worked on Killzone in the past, so there's a lot of speculation that maybe he is bringing back Killzone, and there has been some listings within the company that makes it sound like it could be a multiplayer game, and, well, Killzone has a pretty good multiplayer, so maybe it could be that, though I'm not going to make any bets just yet. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I mean, I don't think that we really have enough proof one way or the other, but once again, even though it has now been announced that one of these unannounced projects was Call of the Mountain, it sounds like that they still might have something else going on. So definitely keep an eye on Guerrilla Games going forward. Now, as for this other PlayStation game, it's now being reported that that Twisted Metal reboot that we keep hearing about is no longer being developed by Lucid Games. This is being reported by Video Game Chronicles, which is a very trusted news outlet by this point. And according to them, instead, apparently Sony has decided to move the series revival to one of its first party studios over in Europe. We don't know exactly which Europe studio this would be, though my, my guess would probably be Fire Sprite or London studio i really don't know who else would be working on this game but lucid games no longer working on this twisted metal reboot is a bit of a surprise i felt like this was a pretty good partnership here and an easy marriage for the two just because you take a look at lucid games and what they did last year with destruction all-stars now i know that that game didn't exactly turn out well but you could easily see that it was heavily inspired by twisted metal just without the guns with how destruction all-stars was Received, though I do kind of wonder if PlayStation kind of paused a little bit and thought maybe they could just do it better internally and then moved it to one of their internal studios. It's really hard to say, but I think in terms of fans, I think this can be both viewed as kind of a good thing and then a bad thing. And the reason I think it's a good thing is because, again, Lucid Games didn't exactly do a great job with Destruction All-Stars, so maybe you might trust one of PlayStation's first-party studios a little bit more. However, at the same time, that actually takes resources away from those first-party studios as well, so you kind of got to look at it from both perspectives and the thing about twisted metal is that i think it's pretty evident by this point that twisted metal is indeed returning but i kind of wonder how it can perform in the year of 2023 or 2024 whenever it releases how is it going to hold up in the modern day of gaming because i don't really see the same excitement for this franchise as what we used to and i know that they have the upcoming show and everything and it's just supposed to coincide with that but i i do genuinely wonder how it's actually going to perform when we do eventually see it let me know what you think about all this though in the comments below are you excited for a new twisted metal game let me know in the comments below let's go ahead and move on over to the poll of the day though and with questions surrounding e3 yet again i wanted to ask you all with e3 being digital again should publishers just focus on their own digital events or partner up and do e3 instead and as you can see here 58 percent of you all did say that you want to see them partner up and do e3 again while 35 percent of you said that publishers should do their own digital events so once again it seems like fans really want to see e3 continue on Onward. And I mean, I completely understand that because and I've said this several times on the channel in the past, but I do view E3 as that holiday for gamers. This is a place for all of these publishers to come together and make all of these massive announcements. And it is just so exciting seeing event after event after event, especially when all of the big three does it together, being PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo. It is very competitive, but it is just so exciting to watch. But at the same time, I do understand that it's become very expensive to do E3 for these publishers. And now that we are kind of moving more towards that digital age, it's just really easy for them to kind of put their own event together and post it when they want to. Now, a couple years ago, they kind of did it mostly throughout the summer, and I felt that that was okay. No, it wasn't the two or three days that we're used to seeing with E3, but there was still a lot of different events over a two or three month period. I didn't think that that was too bad or anything, and I think that for publishers, that might have actually helped them out a little bit, and the reason I say that is because whenever you do everything in a two or three day period, some games unfortunately will get lost in the news because there's just so much stuff to cover. So if you do space things out a little bit more, you're probably gonna get a little bit more coverage that way. So I think there's probably some pros and cons for doing it each way. I have to say, though, in terms of fans, I, I do understand where you're all coming from, though. It is just so, so exciting to get E3, and th that's why, yeah, I would love to see E3 come back myself just for that reason alone. But 
I, I do understand why publishers might be a little bit more apprehensive of doing it that way at the same time. Anyways, though, that's it for this episode. But if you liked the video, don't forget to bell notification and subscribe button for more content just like this. Also, if you'd like to support the channel through Patreon, thank you for making this content possible. Peace out.